Politicians live very public lives and are always expected to be on. So it is noteworthy when one steps forward, as City Councillor Joe Cressy recently did in the pages of Toronto Life magazine, to reveal his private mental health struggles. And here to tell us more, the aforementioned Joe Cressy. Councillor for Spadina Fort York, which is right in the heart of downtown Toronto. Good to have you back in that chair. Thanks, Steve. Which is actually part of the story that we are <laughs> about to tell, because the first line in your piece is, for years, I ignored my panic attacks and convinced myself I was fine. That's the title to your piece. Sheldon, you want to bring the graphic up and we'll tell a little more as we set the table for the discussion to come. I was doing the work I'd always dreamed of and making a real difference, but underneath I was a mess. Shortly after the election, my marriage of two years ended. To cope with the loss, I suppressed all my emotions. I kept myself together at work, but whenever I was alone, I fell apart. Once, I was in the green room at TVO, about to do an interview with Steve Pakin, something I had done many times before. For some reason, I found myself paralyzed by the worry that I would break down and cry on television. Shaking and sweating, I forced myself to walk onto the set, convinced it would be a disaster. I have to tell you, of course, I had zero sense that that was what was going on in your mind in the green room and as we walked here onto this set. But take us through it. What was going on in that green room that I was clearly clueless about? Well, Steve, for you know, much of the last four years, uh, like many Torontonians, like many Canadians, I struggled with mental health issues. And, and for me, it was depression and anxiety and panic attacks. Uh, for a long time, I didn't know what they were. And so these panic attacks, and as you just alluded to, I had one here. Uh, they would come on without expectation. I, didn't, I couldn't find a pattern or a reason to them. And they were debilitating. And so the symptoms which I would experience, um, my chest would be pounding. I would can be thinking I was having a heart attack. Uh, I'd become dizzy and sweaty. Um, and I, we were in the green room. This was a couple of years ago. We were talking about the overdose crisis, mm -hmm. something you and I have talked about a number of times. And I was convinced I was going to walk onto set and break down. Uh, and I couldn't explain it. I didn't know why. I remember doing the interview here and feeling like I was going to fall off the chair. I remember feeling, honestly feeling like I couldn't balance, find my balance. And at the time, I didn't know what it was. I later learned these were panic attacks, which could receive treatment if I was willing to get it. You gave not a hint, not a hint, that there was any problem going on at all. Have you learned how to fake it over the years? Well, listen, I think a lot of us, um, a lot of people, uh, we're, we're brought up to, to mask um, our symptoms and to hide our vulnerabilities. Uh, when it comes to mental illness, I mean, Steve, this is something when it comes to mental illness that I grew up in a family where we spoke really openly about mental health. Uh, my father had two brothers, um, one of whom tragically took his own life after a psychotic episode. Uh, my, his other bro brother, my uncle, has lived rather courageously with schizophrenia for 45 years. And in our family, like every family, there was mental illness, but we spoke really openly about it. I mean, a dinner table conversation talking about mental health stigma was not unusual. But meanwhile, when I was dealing with my own depression, you know, where you'd wake up in the morning, tired before you get out of bed. Or when I was dealing with my own severe anxiety and, and which turned into panic attacks, I didn't know what they were. I, I kept going to doctor after doctor looking for a physical diagnosis. Mm -hmm. There must be something wrong with my heart or my chest or my balance or my immune system. And it's, so even though I had this family setting which was supportive and mental health was not something shrouded in silence, when I had to deal with my own mental illness, I was utterly unprepared and it took me a long time to acknowledge that it wasn't physical, it was mental. Well, but that, now, who gets the blame for that? I mean, presumably there's a healthcare system there that did not adequately diagnose what you were going through. Well, I think when it comes to mental health, uh, there's a lot of work to do. So this is not uncommon. Um, you know, the stats, one in five Canadians every year are living with a mental illness. Every single year, one in five Canadians. And according to the Center for Addiction and Mental Health, by the time uh, we turn 40 uh, in Canada, one in two Canadians will have or have had a mental illness. Hmm. So it's everybody. Hmm. It is all of us. And so I think it's fair to say that in the last 20 years, we've started to break down the stigma associated with mental illness. There still isn't the awareness 
of mental illness isn't just a severe crisis that hits you. It can be often, think of spraining an ankle. You need tools to cope. Mm. You sprain an ankle, you get help. We go through points in our life where, for a situational reason, you're going to be depressed. You know, yeah, you break up from a marriage or you lose a loved one. You're going to be depressed, and that's okay to ask for help. Uh, but the stigma still is there. Part of the reason I'm sharing my story and have is for my own healing and health, but also to help break that stigma. But also, far too many people can't access the supports even if they know they need them. Well, let's do this. Let, let's play a clip from you yeah. of that night, and I want people to see this, and let's, let's play it, and then we'll come back and chat. Sheldon, please, if you would. Let's get started on this. How significant a change do you believe this is on the part of the provincial government to wade into this? Well, it's a sea change, and it's a sea change at the provincial level, certainly in Toronto where we're bringing them forward, and in the country of Canada where the Minister of Health has also said we need safe injection sites. And it's a sea change because for years we talked about drug use as something that you could hide, as something you could arrest your way to a solution, but it's a public health issue. Okay, as I look at that guy, I ask the question, you come right out of the gate with a good, strong, solid answer, no hemming or hawing, no, not betraying any sense that anything was wrong. What was really going on there? Uh, well, beyond the fact that I think I look better then than now, <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm serious about that. Um, you know, beneath the table, my legs were shaking uh, and I was terrified. Now, and this for me, it, it, and it wasn't just that I'm on camera talking to you, and for a lot of people, um, you know, there is a certain level of stress and anxiety with stepping on the stage and speaking public, in public. But in that instance, for me, uh, I was convinced I was about to fall over. I, you know, and this is, you know, where my, where my tipping point emerged was a couple years ago, not long after that interview, in fact, um, I woke up at 2 in the morning um, convinced I was having a heart attack. And um, I called the ambulance. I was rushed to Mount Sinai. And, of course, after a round of blood work and an ECG, I was told yet again, this was not my first time at the Emerge, mm. that I was fine. How old were you at the time? Oh, 32. 32. You 31. thought you were having a heart attack at and, 32. Yeah, I was convinced that I'd worked myself to death. And, mm. But that was the final tipping point, that this was not physical. I needed help. And... You know, since I've sh shared my story, the number of people who've reached out to me to say, you know, I had my own 2 a.m. trip to the Emerge, thinking I was having a heart attack when it was anxiety or a panic attack. Um, or the number of people who've reached out to me to say many of the symptoms, the, the chest pains, the dizziness, the unease that I described, they've described. And they were having, but they're undiagnosed. And I think part of the level of care and treatment we need is one that people know First of all, that there is treatment, that it works. In my case, I started seeing a phenomenal psychiatrist at CAMH uh, who um, prescribed a series of treatments for me. Uh, I take an antidepressant, Ciprolex, still today, uh, and that works for me. I use cognitive behavioral therapy, which is a tool to shift your focus from irrational thoughts, such as I'm sitting here talking to you and I might fall over and collapse, to, to shift those thoughts to positive thoughts. I'm having a conversation with Steve. He's a nice guy. This is an important mm -hmm. topic. And so through medication, through cognitive behavioral therapy, and also just through conversations um, with a psychiatrist, it's helped me to manage and cope. And so treatment works, and people need to know that. I must confess, I have looked through the glass of this table to see whether your legs are shaking <laughs> now, and they are not. You're okay right now? You're feeling fine right now? Yeah, no, you know what? I, I mean, I feel great mm -hmm. these days. And I mean... As with anybody, as in life, there are days that are up and there are days that are down. Hmm. But I think in my instance, everybody's unique. What happened to me in so many ways is that for a long time, I, I suppressed all my emotions in order to fuel my work and my ambition, uh, but also to cope with challenges at home. So like many men, I became a rock, impenetrable. You cannot break me. Here's our, listen, you wrote about this in the, in the piece. Here's a quote, I wore my job. Like a suit of armor, nothing would interrupt my ambition. I wasn't okay, but I couldn't admit it, let alone explain it. Explain what that means, though. You wore the job like a suit of armor. Well, for me, you know, I think one of the biggest challenges um, that I experienced, and I think this is for a lot of men, is learning how to process emotions. Mm -hmm. And I think when it comes to anxiety disorders and depression, a lot of it deals with 
with humans learning how to balance their emotions and learn how to manage their emotions. And so in my case, listen, I, I got elected to city council when I was 30 years old. I was hungry. I loved the work I was doing, but I was also ambitious. And so to allow me to work 16-hour days while I was struggling in my personal life, I just blocked off all emotions. And so what happened in my instance, which uh, is not unique. So in many cases, a transformational moment is the trigger for mental health, not just a negative one. People often think of a divorce or the loss of a, of a loved one as, as a trigger uh, for depression, for example. In my case, I fell head over heels in love with a woman named Grace a couple years ago. And suddenly, that suit of armor I developed to block out all emotion so I could just work, it had cracked. I was feeling all sorts of things, right? Good things. But suddenly, I didn't know how to process those emotions. Right? It's, it's that simple. And so how am I doing today, to your question, Steve? I'm doing great because it's taken me a lot of time and work. But I have learned in my 30s, finally, how to process emotions, how to balance work with personal life, and how to enjoy it for the first time. And who is Grace to you today? Well, so Grace is, is well, is my wife today. There you go. Uh, yeah. And But she's the love of my life. Um, but, you know, this is, I think, one of the things I've realized, when I shared my story, um, I honestly didn't expect this would be a big deal. I thought I would get the odd email or phone call. And the response has been overwhelming, both from people reaching out to say, I've had similar experiences, or I'm also looking for help to having public conversations with people like yourself. And I think part of that is because um, one thing I realize is men, as men, we don't talk about it. That there is an, that stigma associated with mental illness of, you know, just suck it up and deal with it, especially for men when it comes to describing vulnerability. Well, particularly in your profession, you're not really allowed to acknowledge in your profession that you have any problems or infirmities or you know, any, anything at all, right? You guys have all got to be perfect all the time or well, your opponents take advantage of it. You know, I mean, certainly in the public eye, a lot of people have been surprised to uh, describe what many would see as weakness. I see it as a strength, hmm. right? Understanding our frailties and managing them and learning from them. I see that as a strength. But the principle of being on, this is something that when it comes to mental illness and how common it is, think of teachers, you know, waking up every single day and going and having to stand in front of a class and be up. Or nurses or camp counselors. I mean, all of us have to be on in some way. Mm -hmm. uh, in my case, it's on in the bright lights maybe here and we're talking on television. But that's what's so hard for so many and why it's so important that people access the treatment and care they need is because being on when you're not feeling well is not easy. Right. I, I wonder if you, this is going to sound strange, but I wonder if you were actually more effective at your job, even going through the mental health challenges that you were, than you might otherwise have been, because you so didn't want to deal with your private life that you buried yourself in your public life and therefore spent all your time on it, probably got good at it as a result. Is that fair to say? You know, I, 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 would, I disagree. Mm -hmm. um, I think in any profession, and certainly in politics, where it requires a great deal of empathy and understanding for who you're serving and who you're seeking to help, um, I think in any profession, the more we are aware of the struggles around us, um, the more we're in tune with ourselves, the better we are at it. The more, in, so that ability to understand struggle, to empathize with people who are struggling, I think leads to better decisions, leads to better outcomes, it also leads to better work environments. One of the hardest conversations I remember having when I was in, in the depths of my depression and anxiety was with my own staff. It was, it, Did they know? No, not, not initially. And I remember hmm. sitting down with my own staff um, almost in tears as I had to tell them what I was going through because I needed them to be there with me. Hmm. You know, because I would have the panic attack I dealt with in your green room. I mean, these would happen all the time. Uh, I remember being at a at a summit on the overdose crisis in Ottawa, a national summit that had been convened. And I was there representing the city. And I fled in panic. I fled the summit, went into the washroom, nearly, nearly collapsed. Uh, and I, again, was convinced I was having a heart attack. Uh, there, there would be moments at City Hall. I remember one. We, I was having a meeting with senior, city, senior staff at the city. We were talking about Rail Deck Park, this large park mm -hmm. proposal in Toronto. And I pretended to take a phone call and went into the bathroom to cry. And I needed my staff 
um, in my own office to understand what I was going through because I couldn't do it alone. Hmm. And, and this is the stigma we talk about and why we need that support. Um, you know, the Center for Addiction and Mental Health did a survey just a couple years ago, and 40% of Ontario workers said that they, are afraid, they would be afraid to tell their employers if they were dealing with mental illness. And so the more we share these stories, uh, the healthier we all are, the more we're able to support each other. But I do believe, coming back to where you started, I do believe we're better at our job when we are more open to other people's struggles and are more open to our own emotions. Okay. Have you, now that you know what you've got and yeah. you've been able to get treatment for it and you're dealing with it, are you having any more panic attacks? You know what, I, I haven't had a panic attack now in about two years. Um, um, around that, yeah. And it, it's because I have learned techniques to control um, the panic when it's coming on. In so many ways, anxiety and panic attacks are, fear, are a fear of the future and an irrational fear of the future. And so you can learn techniques to shift your thinking from what if I collapse on stage to shifting that thought to you're not going to collapse on stage. You're just a little worried that it won't go well. <laughs> right? And so, no, I haven't had a panic attack, but I still have ups and downs. There are still days um, where, for irrational reasons, I, which I can't describe, I'm scared. Um, but I've, I've developed tools to manage mm. them. In hindsight, do you think you made your own set of circumstances worse because you tried very hard to ignore it or bury it or not deal with it as opposed to facing it head on from the start? Oh, you know, if, listen, if I were to go back a couple of years um, and if I could talk to that, you know, that 32-year-old uh, that, that I was sitting in the emergency room at Mount Sinai, um, terrified that, he, you know, he was about to die of a heart attack, if I could go back and tell him that this was the best thing he was in his life he'd about to go through, I would. Um, mm. And, of course, you know, the, the earlier we can seek access to treatment, the better. Um, but I'm, you know, I, listen, I'm lucky. You know, I'm lucky how this all worked out. And, and I'm very cognizant of that, Steve, in that, you know, I had the essential um, support of friends and family who would listen without judgment, and I also had access to treatment. That is not mm. the norm. Your colleagues on Toronto City Council, how, if at all, do they treat you differently now as a result of knowing this about you? You know, it, it, this is when I said, um, when I told you that a lot of people have reached out to me to say I have my own stories mm -hmm. with depression or anxiety, or, you know, I, I'm also dealing with symptoms you've described. How did you access treatment? I want it. I've had a lot of those comments. And I've had a lot of those comments from my colleagues, hmm. right? And it, you know, it, I've had colleagues reach out to say, city council colleagues, let's go out for lunch. I want to tell you about my journey, right? Hmm. And just like me, and they had no idea about me, I had no idea about them. And it just, it goes to, it reinforces just how common mental illness is, just how normal it is. You know, it's, if, you, if you're hobbling down the hallway on crutches, people will say, hey, what's up? You okay? Can I help? Right? Meanwhile, if we're walking down the hallway, not hobbling, w feeling deeply depressed that day, nobody knows. We usually don't mm -hmm. tell them, and thus we don't get the help we need. And so the outcome of this has been my own learning about how common mental illness is, but also I feel closer to my colleagues. When we talk about this, you know, life is hard, right? Like, you know, let's not kid ourselves. It is this thing called life, finding a way to live and be happy, and it is not easy. And so the more we share our struggles, the more we share our vulnerabilities, the easier it becomes. And so I feel closer to my colleagues since they've reached out to me. And some of them are right-wingers, and we don't normally don't vote the <laughs> same way, but I feel closer to them now, and that's a good thing. That is a good thing. Uh, I want to thank you for coming on to TVO tonight and sharing your story and, and feel somewhat guilty about the fact that some of this happened here on the premises, but uh, in hindsight, the details um, make perfect sense, and I want to thank you for coming on tonight. Well, listen, thanks, Steve, and I'll, I'll tell you, as... As much as I'm uh, privileged to be able to share this story, uh, I will tell you that I, I'm looking forward to us talking about overdoses and the solutions <laughs> and parks and bike lanes again, because it's not, it's not always fun talking about vulnerability. <laughs> Back to politics next time. You got, you got it. it. That's Joe Cressy, Spadina Fort York, Toronto City Councillor. Thanks, Joe.
The Agenda with Steve Bacon is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. Helping businesses stay on the right side of change with strategic thinking, insightful decisions, and business leadership. Are you on the right side of change? Ask an Ontario CPA.